there is a 98% chance you have something called forever chemicals in your blood, also known as PFAS. These chemicals are everywhere, quite literally. They've been detected in some of the most remote places on Earth, like polar bears in the Arctic Circle. PFAS have been used in non-stick cookware, food packaging, stain-resistant carpet, and waterproofing our outdoor gear. More specifically in things like rain jackets, tents, sleeping bags, pants, and shoes. PFAS don't break down naturally, and they are causing serious health issues to us and the environment. The government has been passing legislation to ban them. Many say that is not enough though, citing many companies are finding loopholes and continue to use them. How bad are they? And what, if anything, is being done to stop them? This crisis will doom us for decades, hundreds of years to come, which is really problematic given how dangerous these chemicals are. In addition to exploring outdoor topics like this, Greenbelly makes big meal bars packed with 650 calories and protein, fat, fiber, and carbs for big outdoor adventures. Greenbelly meals have been called Rice Krispie Treats on steroids and come in five flavors using all natural ingredients. Green Belly Meals, and these are these really delicious uh, bars. Green Belly. Green Belly. Green Belly Meals. Green Belly. If you have an outdoor adventure coming up, check us out at greenbelly.com. PFAS are a natural fit for outdoor gear. Who doesn't want a rain jacket that can hold up to soaking rains? Or boots that keep your feet dry when crossing streams? One of the most toxic jobs regarding PFAS was someone who is using ski wax in a ski shop. Ski wax has such a high concentration of PFAS. And in Park City, Utah, which is a huge skiing, snowboarding destination in the United States, their water system has been polluted by PFAS, specifically because of ski wax coming off of their ski mountains and hills. One of the first and most famous uses of PFAS was in Gore-Tex. That became really popular late 80s into the 90s, and it's something that consumers look to specifically. It is used in a lot of different products, such as boots, jackets, tents, etc., to create a waterproof and oilproof lining. Gore-Tex was revolutionary not just for its water resistance, but also its breathability. PFAS are used in the membranes of the fabric to allow sweat to escape while keeping rain out making them almost unbeatable for comfort during strenuous activities and wet conditions. After the success of Gore-Tex, many major brands like Patagonia, Keen, and Fjallraven jumped on the PFAS bandwagon, putting them in jackets, boots, tents, backpacks, anything that might benefit from water resistance. If you see terms like durable water repellent or DWR in your gear, there's a good chance PFAS are involved. Like the start of a superhero movie, PFAS were the result of a lab accident by researchers at the chemical company DuPont. In the 1930s, chemists who were working in a lab, um, one of them spilled something on his shoe and realized that the water beaded up on his shoe and did not soak in. They had discovered something potentially groundbreaking. The results of that discovery, it has revolutionized the plastics industry and led it into rigorous applications not otherwise possible. PFAS were first used in the atomic bomb. And after World War II, DuPont monetized these new chemicals further. The first major commercial application was in Teflon cookware. DuPont Teflon makes the difference. This non-stick finish for cookware never needs scouring. PFAS is an acronym for polyfluoroalcohol substances. The thing that all PFAS have in common is a backbone of carbon and fluorine atoms. And this bond is the strongest bond known to humans. It's really, really tough to break, which means that these PFAS don't break down, which is why they've received the nickname Forever Chemicals. This strong bond is what gives PFAS their water-resistant, oil-resistant, and stain-resistant properties. PFAS are bioaccumulative, meaning they build up in your body over time. This long-term exposure can lead to all sorts of health problems. For both humans and wildlife, there are three exposure pathways that you can get a load of PFAS into your body that can harm you. You can ingest it, you can inhale it, or you can dermally absorb it. The companies who manufacture PFAS learned early on about the hazards to human and environmental health. As early as the 1950s, there was evidence that they could cause cancer and lead to death. DuPont had a couple of their scientists die early in the production and experimentation with PFOS because of the high level of exposure that they had. They made a very specific effort to conceal this information 
not only from their scientists, but the general public, regulators. This was the beginning of the problem. DuPont covered up health issues related to these new chemicals, specifically the deaths of some of their scientists. More on this in a minute though. PFAS have also been linked to decreased fertility, high blood pressure, and immune disorders. The effects are especially problematic in children and pregnant women where exposure can lead to development delays and other long-term health issues. They even limit the effectiveness of vaccines. The same thing is true for the environment then. So if it bioaccumulates in our bodies, then it also bioaccumulates in the environment. Communities near factories that produce or use PFAS have seen high levels of PFAS contamination, leading to serious health problems for residents. One of the most famous cases is Parkersburg, West Virginia. In 1999, lawyer Robert Billet filed a case against DuPont on behalf of a Parkersburg farmer, Wilbur Tennant, whose cattle's teeth were turning black, calves were being born with facial deformities, and were dying. The farmer approached Robert Billot because he wanted to know what was killing his cattle and making his family sick, and they found out that DuPont was polluting the entire area around Parkersburg, West Virginia, with PFOS and 70,000 plus residents. And it wasn't just cattle. Children born in Parkersburg around the same time had similar facial deformities to Tenet's cattle. Billet won the lawsuit and it became a case study on how PFAS contamination affects peoples, animals, and the environment. The case was made into a documentary called The Devil We Know and became a feature film called Dark Water starring Mark Ruffalo and Anne Hathaway. People living near PFAS factories face the highest risk, but PFAS are everywhere. In 2024, the EPA released a study that showed over 60% of the U.S. water supply was contaminated. They are so ubiquitous that they are in about 98% of our blood. Even in the ocean, there's PFAS everywhere in the ocean. They found PFAS in the Arctic Circle, in polar bears, in very, very remote places. As awareness of the dangers of PFAS have grown, so too has a response from governments and regulatory bodies. The Environmental Protection Agency has been working on nationwide regulations to limit the release of PFAS into the environment. However, progress has been slow, and the EPA regulates on a chemical by chemical basis. That's a problem because there are so many of them, thousands, even millions, that the industry will just replace a banned PFAS with a different one. We do have limits in drinking water, but for only six of the PFAS, so regulating six is just a drop in the bucket. Many states are taking the lead by regulating PFAS broadly as a class of chemicals which according to many supporters is the best way to regulate PFAS. California is making the biggest impact. A new law going into effect in 2025 will heavily regulate the use of PFAS in textiles. Because of California's size and economic power, this will affect the entire outdoor industry. California is suing 3M, DuPont, and 16 smaller companies, accusing them of covering up the harm caused to the environment from chemicals manufactured by the firms. And so essentially, if a company wants to sell at any retail location or even online in the state of California, it's not just jackets and clothing, it's also tents, it's backpacks, footwear. It's pretty much anything that uses a fabric needs to be PFOS free. New York has a similar ban that will come into play starting in 2028, and other states are working on similar regulations. And in Maine, they're regulating them as a class and saying, you can't have PFAS in any product. Many outdoor companies are responding by announcing phase-out plans for PFAS. For example, Fial Robbins started phasing out PFAS in 2009. Patagonia is committed to eliminating PFAS from their gear by the end of 2024 and Keen launched their Detox the Planet initiative in 2014 to remove harmful chemicals, including PFAS, from their products. As of 2018, they claim to have reduced their PFAS use by 98%. So what are these companies switching to? Potentially fabric treatments, waxes, and other PFAS-free fabrics. Nyx Wax, a common fabric treatment, was founded in the UK over 45 years ago and has been PFAS-free since the beginning. And with the new legislation, they've started to lean into this to promote their product. Now they're working with large brands such as Outdoor Research to implement a PFAS-free solution into their apparel, um, and even things like down, so the insulation can also have a higher water resistance. Polyurethane is used to create a microporous membrane, such as in Marmot's membrane and Jack Wolfskin's Texapore. In green theme technologies, manufactures a hydrocarbon-based treatment known as Impel, used by Black Diamond. 
Waxes have been used for centuries to add waterproofing. The ultralight crowd in the outdoor industry wouldn't love a wax coating on their products, but they would be applicable for things like tents or jackets if people are like just going fishing for the day or something like that. Notably Dyneema, which has taken off in the last decade as a lightweight water resistant material for tents and backpacks, is PFAS free. We made a whole video about Dyneema, link below if you're interested. Oftentimes, the biggest drawback for PFAS alternatives is performance. Many current options on the market don't perform quite as well as PFAS treated gear like Gore-Tex. So I, I think we in the outdoor industry all have to get comfortable with products that don't perform as well as we have been used to over the last 25 years. But what's really exciting is we're actually seeing some newer alternatives that are very promising and appear to work very, very well. Another major challenge is cost. Developing and testing new materials can be expensive. So if PFAS are everywhere and don't break down, what can we do? There's a website here in the US called PFAS Central, and they have a list of outdoor gear, makeup, everything that they know that is truly PFAS free. You just have to ask questions, you have to educate yourself, and you have to advocate for yourself. When you're buying new gear, if a product says it's stain resistant, water resistant, or scratch proof, there's a high chance it contains PFAS. Many companies are now labeling their products as PFAS free. Even if you remove PFAS from your gear and personal items, there is still the risk of exposure to PFAS in the environment. Drinking water is one where the exposure is a very, very high concern and many people are exposed. There are filters that will filter out 100% of PFAS from drinking water. Our food supply is another area of contamination. Things like milk, fish, all of those tend to have a higher concentration of PFAS. So leaning more into beans and rice and things like that tends to lower or at some. PFAS have clearly helped us outside and protected us from the elements, but this performance has come at a cost. Consumers are going to have to weigh the trade-offs between performance and price with environmental and health concerns. We are a small team that loves the outdoors. If you like this, we'd love it if you gave us a like and subscribe. Thanks to Dr. Kyla Bennett, Amy Borenstein, and Megan Carney for their help making this video.